Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Tell Me More, week four. I'm here with Alex Rahill Sr. Four. again. Yeah, number four. Four. Wow. Congratulations, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with Alex Rahill Sr. again. And uh, this time we're talking about this sermon from this past Sunday. We'll see what we title this one afterward. Could be Tell Me More About Coming Back to Mission. Could be Tell me more about feeding my sheep. We'll see. Probably coming back to mission. That's the one I like in my head. So we're going to get started here talking about uh, the sermon from this past Sunday. If you missed it, please check it out on this same podcast thread. Uh, you can also find it on our YouTube if you'd prefer to watch a video. So my first question for you, Senior, is you wanted to talk about Peter specifically coming back to mission. Why was that important to you? to end our series comeback stories with? Uh, you know, you really have a good way of uh, modulating your voice and your questions. So I was like thinking, <laughs> <laughs> send this podcast to your friends, people. This is going to be great. We're going to have fun. Nothing but professional oh, here, folks. Oh, boy. OK, sorry. Now, I, I totally went uh, squirrel. <laughs> um, why end? Oh, why end with mission? So, so yeah, we, we've been doing this series, Comeback Stories. You ended on purpose with Peter coming back to God's mission, which is a different kind of comeback story than the ones we were looking at the rest of the series. Why was that important to you to end with? Uh, because I think Peter's every person. Hmm. And uh, that's why we resonate with Peter so much. Peter failed catastrophically. And I, m most of the people... Um, there's usually three reasons people give me for why they're not living the life God has for them. Uh, one is they've failed so um, dramatically, catastrophically, that they just, they're not worthy. Um, and of course, Peter does that in, in spades. Um, the second one is uh, I, I love, I, I like Jesus. I, people say they love Jesus. I don't, uh, I don't I often think they don't know what they're saying with that. Not because they're ignorant, and that didn't come out right, but because uh, really biblical love is um, you're saying something pretty significant there and you, and you can't love Jesus. And this is where the second one comes in, but I don't love his church. I don't like his church. Mm -hmm. You can't love me. Say you really love me and hate my wife. Right. Um, because we're, we're connected. Now I believe the church is the greatest um, testimony for Jesus um, but I actually think it weighs out more as the greatest testimony against Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> like, why people? Right now. Yeah. So there's there's failure. There's the church, and really, mission and the church go hand in hand. We can't really be about the mission of God without being integrated with His church. And I can talk about that. It's kind of like um, a quarterback wanting to play football but not wanting to play on a team. Yeah. Right. 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 So hey. let, let me ask you this. Uh, you, we've been we've been talking about God's mission, and that may be insider language. Some of you may have grown up in church and hear that uh, God has a mission, but you don't know how to articulate that. Others of you uh, know exactly what that means, and you know what it's about. And some of you maybe have thought, "Oh, God is loving," but what are you talking about? God's mission. So, why don't you take that? Up, tell us more about that. What is God's mission, and what's our role in it? Yeah, yeah. So actually, um, so mission comes from uh, the um, Latin word missio. So uh, again, um, Latin was a, a prime language in the Western culture, and and so the word in the Greek is is apos, apostle. Apostolos is the verb form of that, which means sent with intent. It means that you're, you're sent out by a commissioning authority for a purpose. So a soldier might get told by the king, I want you to go here and um, take this message to this ambassador. They're on a mission. They're sent with a purpose of delivering something. And um, there's clarity around who is their commanding officer or leader and what is their task. Mission. So there's mission, uh, and uh, there's the master, and there's the mission. And those two things are uh, connected all the time. So if you go on a rescue mission, um, 
you're sent out uh, to go and find this person and bring them back. You know, I just was reading about a rescue of a person at sea. They were sent out by commissioning authorities, you know, um, what's the uh, Coast Guard? Coast Guard, yeah. And, um, uh, and they're very clear, they were sent with intent, with a purpose to find this ship and rescue these people and then bring them back alive. That was the goal. Mm. So mission is, um, and mission is something, it's this idea of purpose, that, that there's a larger purpose that um, uh, is being orchestrated in the world and that you actually are, have an integral part to play in that purpose, that uh, God has a mission, but uh, which is to spread his, uh, good, the good news of his kingdom. So there's good works that need to be done and there's uh, good uh, government practices, policies. There's all these good things that need to get done in the world. And we are uh, co-regents with God. If you read Genesis 1, 26 through 28, that's actually the first commissioning. It's the cultural mandate. So we often think about the Great Commission. Um, and so, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you want to, me to keep riffing on mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's important because I think... So I'm, you're, you're talking about two different kinds of mission, right? You're talking about there's this original mission that then gets violated, interrupted, disrupted by sin, corrupted by sin. <clears throat> and there's a secondary mission that um, God mandates for the church in uh, the book of Acts. And um, that's the mission you know we're currently on right now. So tell me a little bit about, uh, tell me more about the first mission. What's the first mission? Because that mission is enduring. It's not... Um, that the second mission of the Great Commission didn't replace the first one. It's in addition to the first one. And so tell me about uh, the first mission and then uh, about how this second mission plays into that, because this is the purpose uh, God is working out in the world. And this is by extension, our purpose as the church. So I think it's just, it's important for people to get clear on that. So yeah. Really yeah. Nice. There's um uh, if you, I don't know if you want to pull that up on your screen at all, but oh, do I? Genesis one, Jamie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jamie, Sorry. could you pull up a uh... Uh, Genesis one twenty six and following uh, one twenty six through twenty eight? Though gives you the main kernel of it. Uh, and let me um, share my screen here. All right. One, here we go, 26. Right, so uh, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. So this is that, again, uh, we, I mentioned it in the message, imago Dei. You hear that phrase, it means image of God. This is one of the most important phrases, I would argue, in Western civilization. If you have any rights, claims to justice, Anything along those lines, it comes from this verse because this was an original Christian thought. This is an original biblical thought that if everybody's made in God's image, then they all deserve to be treated with respect, fairness, justice. They should not be abused or harmed. They, their lives should not be taken. There's not classes of people where one class gets to uh, rule over or subordinate the other class. This is part of um, the argument against slavery and other forms of oppression. Right. So what this phrase is really actually one of the cornerstones of Western civilization. When people go, I want to throw out biblical faith or anything else, go, yeah, you're going to lose a whole lot more than you think if you throw out that idea. Right. Um, so people are made in the image of God in our likeness. And again, you see that plurality there, which is a reference to some could be a reference to the trinity i won't go down that road <laughs> so that they may rule over that's an important word have dominion over um and uh rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground so god created mankind in his own image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them god blessed them okay so this kind of super infusion of grace and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We'll stop there. 
But let's just say this, there's some core thoughts here. Um, one is everybody has the, it should be treated with dignity and respect. When we talk about racial reconciliation, um, that's here. Uh, where we talk about uh, sex trafficking, that's here. Where we talk about things like um, abortion and people don't, but you know, what? why do we protect the, our stand up for the lives of unborn children? That That's here. In a third world country or, or a harsh political regime, why should we intervene? Because people shouldn't be treated like that. Why not? Because we're all made in the image of God. And this is the bit, this is a Christian foundation for caring for the earth, which has been ignored for the past right. 100 plus so, years. Thank you for teeing that up. So this is actually the stewardship mandate as well. So when people say, uh, you know, when I was a young Christian, one of the things people would say, it's all going to burn. You know, so there was kind of this idea like the new heavens and the new earth, there wasn't going to, there was a, some misunderstanding there. And people interpreted that as, then we can just use things as we will and um, not take care of them. And that's actually a, uh, a heresy in some ways. It's, it's a wrong thought about something in scripture. So yeah, this makes us responsible. We should be the best stewards of the earth. Mm -hmm. We don't worship the earth. We rule over it. And so that word rule over means co-workers um, with God. You're going to see that phrase show up again. This is part of joining God and God's mission. So we're working with God to accomplish his purposes on the earth to care for the fish and the sea and the birds and all living things, especially those made in his image, humanity. Uh, and that we're supposed to, now that word be fruitful and increase in number is this word multiply, fill the earth. And so this idea that God is the king and, and he should rule and reign over us, that he teaches us love, truth, grace, justice, and that we now are co-rulers uh, with God to bring his love, grace, truth, and justice to bear on all the earth. And this is part of, and we're going to see this actually again. This is funny because we I'm going to show you in John 21. This comes up in John 21. Sorry, I, I think I've got a, someone mowing along back here. Uh, welcome to Podcast World. That's okay. I'll, I'll cut here. I'll cut here. And do you want to turn your um, mail and messages off too? You keep getting dings. Oh, dang it. So if you turn your, um, if you just turn the app off, you won't get the notifications. Oh, because obviously you can't undo the internet or something like that right now, you know. Huh. I don't know what to do. Just turn the, the mail app off and turn the um, uh, messages app off. Just quit them. Oh, is that all I got to do? Yeah. <clears throat> I quit it. Okay, great. It just puts it to sleep. It just means you're not going to get notifications. Got from it. it. Um, great. All right, ready? Hold on, let me make sure you're still with me. Yeah. Great. Okay. What are we, uh, okay. So, so I, I, I'm uh, I'm gonna interject here. Yeah. With them. Okay. Here we go. Coming back in. So one of the things that's interesting to me about this that I've seen in our own kind of experience as human beings where this shows up is, you know, people will often do home gardens and talk about how fulfilling it is to garden and how fulfilling it is um, to be connected to the land in that way. Or you hear hunters talk about that a lot, being in a deer blind and watching the world wake up and just feeling like this is this something about this I was made for. Or um, even like pets, I think this is why we like to have pets. There's something about this that's inherent in us that we realize um, something inside of me was made to take care of you in this way. You know, I have a dog named Gracie who I love very much. And I've been asking myself, why do I love this dog? All she does is take from me. All she does is make my life inconvenient. She has tons of expectations on my time, tons of expectations on my energy and availability to her. What makes me so connected to this animal that gives me nothing? And I think it's this. Right? It is. This. It's a great observation. Yeah. So, and this is where all of a sudden you go, oh, wow, I've been thinking, I've lived like this, or I have these 
yearnings and right. suddenly you see this articulated where it's like, oh, because I was made to care for. Um, and so we'll see in the next chapter in Genesis 2, God puts uh, Adam and Eve in the garden to nurture it and take right. care of it. So right. this idea of human flourishing and um, earthly flourishing are connected. That's why we thrive in flourishing environments and we, we um, feel downcast or distraught in environments where there's destruction and mm -hmm. and especially if we feel like we don't have the ability to uh, bring restoration right so that's mission one care for the earth care for everything that god has made be a co-ruler with god and taking care of all the things that he's made that's that's mission number one so what's mission number two what do you uh, want me to jump to oh okay um so if you go to um so Here's the thing, the Great Commission, so there's, there's um, uh, several commissions throughout the Bible about the mission of what people are called to do, um, but the, the church's commission is an extension of this commission because we have, the, um, we have this beautiful creation um, that God made, and we're joining God in that creation, and then we have uh, and all the flourishing that was intended. And then there's the fall, where left to given free will, given choice, um, we turn against God and not toward God. And as we turn a, a, away from God and away from God's purposes, we experience um, the fall, which is we call sin. And what that is, is that deep wounding of the soul. It's that sense of brokenness inside every person um, that uh, they identify with on some, they fall short of the things that they somehow feel they were made for, created for, and that's that brokenness and sin. God's plan then is to reconcile us to himself, which was that relationship was broken, to ourselves. So most people, again, a lot, most of our baggage, drama, hurt is internal. You know, there's a wound inside that bleeds out and creates a wound outside. So mm -hmm. he reconciles us to himself, ourselves, others, and then to the world. Mm -hmm. Those are the four aspects of reconciliation uh, or renewal that God wants to bring. And that's mm -hmm. part of what the church's commission is. Right. It's now to bring that restoration and renewal. Not second, it's not a second mission, it's the extension of the first mission, right? Which is everything's under the rule and reign of God, and we call that the kingdom of God. And so, when we talk about people coming to faith in Jesus, there's personal relationship that's important, but it's not you're not saved as an orphan, you're not you don't come to faith as an orphan, you're you're translated out of one world and into another world, you're translated out of uh, one community and into another community into right. a new family of jesus so right it's a yeah it's more a form of immigration uh yeah in some ways yeah so um where would you like me to jump to, to for the great commission so you you can go to um uh, matthew um 28 uh, eight, uh 18 following you know, to actually 16 following because i think there's something pretty instructive here too then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to a, the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. There's always this tension of faith and doubt. Yeah. But I want us to appreciate that it's in the worshiping community that the full revelation of Jesus takes place. Mm. We want a one-on-one -on -one encounter with God, and wow. God gives us that. But the real revelations, the full revelation of Jesus only comes in the worshiping community. Yeah. And that's why the church is, we think we can get rid of the church and still have Jesus. Yeah. And actually, that's the reason the church, in, uh, specifically in the United States, is so anemic. Because mm -hmm. we have so many people, that's a heresy, and we have people believing that. So they're missing the full revelation of Jesus because they're worshiping him alone. You know, they're doing buffet Jesus. They're doing, you know, I pick and choose this. And I, I, I listen to this person's podcast. I go to this person's Bible study. And yeah. on one hand, that's not bad. But on the other hand, they're missing out on the full mission of Jesus. 
And uh, when we get back to John 21, I'm going to show you that because part of Jesus' revelation of what it means to be a friend or a lover of other people, um, you can't quit on the community and do that. Mm. So we see this revelation that says, therefore, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So here we go back to the master and the mission, right? Right. So to have a mission, you're sent from a authoritative source. So if you're right. an ambassador, you're sent from your president or king right. and you have authority, not because of yourself, but because of who sent you. Right. So all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm king. I have the power. And now I'm sending you to make disciples. And uh, that word gets convoluted all kinds of ways, but makes disciples of all nations. Um, and I'll just say this. A disciple is a learner of Jesus. It's someone who learns the way of Jesus. It's someone who follows the example of Jesus. And it's a slow, steady progression toward Jesus. It's not a program. It's not a, you know, a book. Uh, it, right. Although those help. I'm not, I don't want to knock that. But we miss out on it's this relational engagement with Jesus and with his community. Okay. Yeah the mandalorian this is the way this is the way and baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit and we get all caught up with baptism but you know what baptism really baptism's core um, element is identification incorporation into the new family of jesus right we think baptism just means i i'm a now a jesus follower and we miss out on the fact that baptism meant i'm coming from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I'm coming out of being an orphan and alone into the new family of Jesus. It's not just some little, you know, mysterious water activity. <laughs> and so we say, oh, I want Jesus. I want that. Uh... Oh, but I don't want to have to be connected to the family. And we actually, there's a lot of people I don't think who've ever been baptized who actually have been in the tub. Yeah because they've never surrendered themselves to the fullness of what Jesus intends. Right. Um, teaching them to obey. So that idea again of, so we come into the family of Jesus, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. This is again, a, as we walk in the way of Jesus, in the worshiping community of Jesus, the mission flows out of our understanding of, learning the ways of Jesus and following them information and application. Yep. I think the Western churches could be accused of being educated way beyond our level of obedience. Mm -hmm. We go to Bible studies all day long. We have, but we, but do we obey it? And actually that's the whole point. When we get back to John 21, one real step of activity is worth a thousand good intentions. And we're, we're churches of a thousand good intentions, and we're, but most, a lot of times people won't take the one real step Jesus says, take, do that, just do this one thing. And then he's with us always to the very end of the age, but he says, therefore go, and the go is the mission now, right? So um, the reason he starts with go here is the disciples had already been baptized and taught, and, uh, and now they're being sent. Right. And so there's actually four commissions in the New Testament, not one. And so if you go to um, John uh, 20, because we'll come back to John 21, if you want to go to John 20, um, uh, verse um, 21. All right. So this is one of the commissions, and it says, and this is where we get missio, right? Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, what did the Father send Jesus to do? To seek and save the lost. And um, to show and share the love of Christ, is the love of God, as the Father sent me, and that's the word missio. Sent is the word missio. It's in the Latin. It's, uh, it's the verb form of apostle. As the Father sent me, I missioed me, I am missioing you. Mm. So that's, the, that's one of the commissions here is, oh, how did the Father? So we have to ask, how did the Father send Jesus? Mm hmm seeking saving serving the people around him and now we're called to seek which is a verb we don't sit around and wait we seek out our neighbor our relative our co-worker 
and we share the love of Christ, uh, both in word and deed, and we serve them. And because that's what brings the kingdom. So now we're being those uh, ambassadors of love. We're conduits of God's love to the world. Mm -hmm. So what does this person need? I, I meet that need. That's what service is. Yeah. And imagine again, a world where every person goes out going, uh, I want to bring the love of Christ today. I'm going to serve Jesus by feeding his sheep, by taking care of his sheep. And I'm going to do the simple acts of goodness and love and service around me. Mm -hmm. So we could rip on more of the commissions. One um, of the things I want to point out, though, from the previous, the Great Commission, is that some of the disciples are doubting there, having seen the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> they're yeah. standing in front of the resurrected Jesus, and they're like, I'm not sure about this. And I think to your point about the classes, one of, one of the misconceptions I think we have as the American church is that understanding uh, is meant to precede obedience, is that I have, to, I have to get this before I can do this. And yes. even at the Great Commission, there's people there that are like, I don't know if this is legit. And um, Jesus is not waiting around for them to get it. He's like, just go. And that's the, the disciples' whole journey, right? Like, none of them understand all the way what's happening. Even at this point, I mean, they still lack the Holy Spirit, right? And so Christian theology <clears throat> is happening. It's not formed. And they're exactly. witnessing it. They're not, they're not studying it yet. And so, but they're, regardless of that, Jesus is just like, listen, things will become clear in time. And there are some things you're just not going to understand yet. Don't worry about it. Go do this thing. So let me say it like this. Thank you for bringing that up. And it is one of the great, uh, I think it's one of the great deceptions in our time. We don't understand our way into living. We live our way into understanding. Woo! Someone preaching now. And no, I, that's so deeply true. It is. Uh, so Jesus just says, follow me. Yeah, but yeah, but we want to talk all, the whole time. And actually, when people are feel like they're like, oh, I've tried following Jesus. It just doesn't work. I go, no, you probably just sat in some lectures. You try <laughs> to understand your way to Jesus rather than live your way to understanding Jesus. Because mm. when you do these things, anybody <clears throat> who does these practices the way of Jesus as opposed to just tries to think out the way of Jesus, they yeah. will all tell you it's transformative. Yeah. So we can look at other mission. If you go to Ephesians 2.10, uh, you can oh, just, yeah. let's hit that real quick. So if we look at this, Alex, in terms of God's got a mission. Right. So every good, every good thing we want to see happen in the world, if we go, why doesn't God do this? Or why doesn't God do that? Um, in Ephesians Jesus, we're told Jesus is the head yep. of the body or the hands and feet. The reason God doesn't do that is we're not doing, living the life of Jesus. We're just talking about right, it. Right, right. Because we are the conduit of God to bring about these changes we want to see in the world. Right. And so the whole point is every good thing we want to see happen in the world is about advancing the kingdom of God, which mm. means we're living under his rule and reign, which means we treat others as we'd want to be treated. We, uh, we love sacrificially. Yep. We are coming into every interaction going, not how can I be served by this person, but how can I serve? And those are all mindsets that inform how we live. So Ephesians 2.10 is a great consolidation of everything I said in Genesis. So if you were to go, um, he starts off, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So he's going, look, well, you know how this whole thing works. <laughs> you were, you know that sin leads to death. Right. And you were following the ways of the ruler of the, look at that, kingdom of the air. There's two kingdoms here. And when we right. come back to John 21, I hope it's going to, people are going to go, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense now. Why um, this happened this way and why John captured right. these thoughts. So you were in a different kingdom. Uh, but if we go down to um, verse four, it says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, but that's that God loved us so much that he wasn't going to leave us to our own devices right. if we chose to receive his grace. So because of his great love for us, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Yeah. And he translates us and moves us into another kingdom, Right. We, we're, we're saved, which means our personal sin is forgiven. 
Mm-hmm. That's an important part of coming into the kingdom of God. And we, because we put our faith in Christ, that mm-hmm. we don't trust in ourselves to bring salvation. We trust in Jesus. Right. He's our Lord and he's our savior. And those are big words, loaded words. But now watch, once we get translated out of the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of the air into the kingdom of light or the kingdom of God, we automatically in that moment now are given a, a new identity. And if we look at verse 10, it says, for we are God's handiwork. It means unique poema. We get our word poem from it. It means unique, one of a kind, masterpiece, creation, created in Christ Jesus. So we have this new identity in Christ. This is our identity. So we talk about being and doing being integrated, right? The, the whole nature of the, the world we live in is we're disintegrated. Our being and our doing are disconnected and we feel that. In Christ, we're reintegrated as whole people. Our being is we are God's handiwork. That's our identity. That's the foundation. That's the root created in Christ. And then the good works, our doing, flows out of that new rootedness because we are like God. And so, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now, this last line is really powerful, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has a plan for you, and um, people get a little ner- nervous about that, but they at the same time are longing for that. Yeah. You are on this earth for such a time as this. God prepared you, gifted you um, with your hurts, hangups, with your wounds and trauma, with your transformation and your intelligence. God prepared you for certain works, and this world will only be the place we want it to be as we're each bringing what God prepared in advance for us to do. Our mission, that's our mission. So our personal mission, it takes place under the um, umbrella of God's overall mission, which is to bring his, um, show and share his love throughout the whole world, Mm -hmm. under his rule, under his leadership. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. That's great. And, And touching on this, we don't have to go off on a huge tangent on this, but you mentioned in the sermon, uh, Peter thought he knew himself better than Jesus knew him. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you, you know, you drew, uh, you drew contention with that idea. And I think that's a common idea that if this is, <clears throat> maybe I'm trying to follow Jesus. I feel like he's asking me to do something, but it's painful. It's causing me to give up my security. It's causing me to do something that uh, is harmful. And um, I think the misconception is, um, that either God doesn't know me well enough to know that this is painful or difficult, or he doesn't care about me enough because this is painful or difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, So tell me a little bit more about uh, God knowing us better than we know ourselves. Cause that we're touching on that in this, in this verse. Yeah, we are because, um, so here's, here's the deal. Um, uh, Who knows? Um, so I had four kids, and uh, and uh, right. who knows a child? And I, and I'd even say, you know, a mother and a father, but a mother. Who knows a child better than the parent? At three or four years old, think about what a kid knows about themselves. I, you know, uh, they they're very self-centered. They're very impulse-driven. The world revolves around them and their wants and their, their needs. Yes. And that's as it should be as a baby. Um, but we, you could argue the parent knows that child way better than the child knows themselves. Right. I think when we have that, on, I, well, I'm trying to simplify this for the sake of time. So we can yeah. go back down 21. But I think when we have that understanding that we are children and God is our father, we pray. And then this comes back to our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, right. who art in the heavens all around us, this this world, this spiritual world all around us, um, that prayer is. Jesus gave us that prayer that way, so we would always understand that we are children of the Father, and the parent knows the child in the best in the best home. The parent knows the child better than they know themselves, and the best home, the parent knows what's best for the child better than the child knows for themselves. Right. And so when God orchestrates things in our lives, it's often, um, 
it's always for our good. Mm-hmm. Not doesn't mean all things are good. Now we that gets confused and it's get confused with Christians. Right. Evil is evil. Uh, sin is sin. Um, everything's not good. But God can use things that happen in our life that are bad. Because again, we're in a world in tension. There's two right. kingdoms at war here. Um, we're in a, we're in a battle, and the enemy is going to shoot you. And um, and and when we understand the spiritual nature of spiritual war. We go, oh, so there's an enemy, and uh, we're fighting against this enemy, and we're going to get wounded. Right. But God can use those wounds for good. Yeah. 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 And we see that in Peter's life. So Peter does some terrible things. You know, he feels very ashamed of, but God actually uses that to make him better. Right. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that real quick, because I think especially when it comes to Uh, Right now, the hot topic is sex, when especially when it comes to something like sex and sexuality, there is just a no way, if God really knew me, if he really cared about me, um, then he would let me fulfill these desires in a way that I want. Yeah. Well, we go back to Genesis 1, male and female, he he made them. Right. And um, something, one thing a lot of people don't want to hear, but it would solve a lot of problems, is... um, your sexuality is part of your foundational identity. Mm-hmm. It's not something that gets made up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and God made uh, female and male because uh, he created this beautiful um, uniqueness and yet sameness. There's this just beauty it's a, uh, of what it means to be a man or a woman. Mm-hmm. And I, I won't go way off on that. That's mm-hmm. a different topic, a different right. day. It's a different podcast. But um, it's like, oh, okay, so God knows best. Right. And I think environmentally and all the things we're screwing around with, I do think people have a lot of um, desires that, that are they're telling the truth mm-hmm. about <clears throat> what they want or feel. Um, and I think that's exacerbated for a number of reasons in our current world and culture. I, I think there's even environmental factors to that, but, um, but just, um, but it doesn't make it good for us. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the faith, right? The faith of like, yep. Hey, cause that's, that's, there's so much of that that's cross translated across all of following Jesus is I don't understand this. I don't like this. I don't know how this is beneficial for me yet, yes. but I trust you and I trust that you know me and that you're going to work this for my good, even though I don't like it. Yes. And the mistake <clears throat> continue to make, and this is where we get in trouble with this next section of scripture, is we try to understand God into obedience instead right. of obeying God into understanding. Right. That's a great, great theme. And that's why so many people don't experience the life of God. Right. They think they're following Jesus when they're actually not. Right. They never have. Right. Because it's all been here. Right. Never here. Right. So, um, so do we have a couple minutes to dive back into John 21? Sure, sure do. Let's hit it. John 21. Okay. So here's, this is pretty cool. And one of the interesting things is, you know, I read a lot of different commentaries or people's perspectives. This is one of the chapters in the Bible that doesn't matter if people are like, where they fall, in, whether they're Christians or not. Again, a lot of New Testament um, uh, uh, commentators, theologians are not necessarily Christian. And, yeah. then, uh, and then you have, again, Christian commentators. They all agree that this chapter is about the church. Mm, mm. And it shows us what the church should be. And mm. we didn't get to touch on that at all. Mm. So um, uh, so let me hit on a couple of quick things here that I think are interesting if we could touch base on that. So again, we talked about Peter coming full circle, empty net, empty life. Right. He's got six other disciples with him, right? Half the yep. band is with him. And the cool thing is Nathaniel, you, and, and it shows the full spectrum of the church actually in kind of like this like little snapshot. So Nathaniel, Jesus says to Nathaniel, if you remember in John 1, he goes, I saw you underneath the fig tree. We right. don't know what happened, but there was this secret thing there that Nathaniel suddenly realized, oh my gosh, you you know stuff that you shouldn't know. Like, right. you're Jesus, you're the Messiah. Right. And, um, he believes so quick. Yeah. Which beautiful and, I don't know, yeah. Maybe it's mostly beautiful, but <laughs> a little superstitious. He's on the way, way, I believe in spiritual things 
he's he's um, on one end of the spectrum. Yeah. Because Jesus actually kind of rebukes him. He goes, you haven't even seen my miracles yet, you believe. <laughs> That's what, right? You haven't even yeah. seen a single miracle. So look, at you got Nathaniel. So he's one end of the spectrum. And Thomas, who gets his name because he's a cynic. Right. Doubting. If I don't see it, if I don't stick my finger in his hand if, and I put my right. hand on his side. So you actually have like the most, um, not, not someone who would believe. Easily. Right. Hyper spiritual, so, you know, perhaps. Yes. Hyper, yes. Hyper spiritual. And then someone who's total cynic. Yeah. They're like the, the uh, poles of this group. And that's right. part of the beauty is they're together. Right. Nathaniel's the guy at the grocery store when his favorite things in stock, he goes, oh, praise God, you saw me. <laughs> exactly. You knew that I was coming for this. Lord, I just, this is a testimony of your goodness to me. And then you got Thomas who goes like. <laughs> I'm blessed. I got that parking spot. I'm so blessed. <laughs> no. Yeah. And if you got that parking spot today, I want you to know. <laughs> you are blessed. Because you have a car. <laughs> and you, and you other have... people in this conversation don't. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so again, we're back to this. John is wanting us to see this picture. And John is the deepest thinker. Um, and we're going to analyze that. So there's always layers with John. So Peter's back to his empty life. Yep. Empty nets, empty life without Jesus. Now look at what it says in verse 4. And this is part of where this is a picture of the church. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Jesus is with them, even though they don't know it. Mm. And Jesus promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's the end of the Great Commission. He said, right. even if you can't see me, you need to know I'm with you. Right. And I will help you right. to the mission I've called you to do. My power, all authority, that's about power. And my presence, my comfort, they're with you always. And that's all you need mm -hmm. to do my mission. Mm -hmm. So he calls out, friends, have you, haven't you any fish? Now, this is actually an extension of this idea of friends. So that word friends is like a term of endearment. It's like, um, hey, but whatever the, it's, a, it's actually, it's like little children. But it, it's really more of this like really personal term and friends is the way the niv interprets it but it's more intimate than that um you know uh yeah so whatever your parents call you you know i say hey buddy you know like there's this kind of like the way you say that that it's like oh that's my dad yeah right yeah, yeah, yeah. and he doesn't call other people that like whatever right you know? right, right. Uh, so this this beautiful term of endearment but i want us i want to just say something here he, there's a there's a connection here and if we had time we could see the whole gospel of john comes together in john 21 mm. so last time jesus talked about friends was in john 15 mm -hmm. and uh we it's the vine and the branches and, right. and if we can um and i'm going to just jump there you, you can jump there if you want I, we don't have to i'm just going to read one, one verse but it's okay. so powerful um so jesus said um you are my friends if you do what I command. So again, obeying ourselves, that our, one, our actions show our faith. Mm. We get this whole faith and works thing screwed up all the time. And people go, oh, that's works. It's like, no, that's what Satan's used. You, believe, you, you obey yourself into understanding, right? Mm. So he says, mm. if you, you're my friends if you do what I command. Mm. Now look at what he says. I no longer call you servants. So he's using terms. Right, right, it's, right. So he just said, you're my friends. Now right. he, he says, I no, I no longer call you servant because right. I'm the master and you're the servant, even though we are servants of the Lord. Right. Because a servant, now look at this, does not know his master's business. Mm. Mm. Now think about that. Like how many people do you know their business? Mm -hmm. they, now, we always say, stay out of my business. <laughs> but I want us to see something here because he's going to define what a friend is in a really concise way that right. if we just lived by that, we could walk away and just go, oh, my gosh, this is if I just do this, the world's going to be better. So a friend does not know his bad master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Mm. 
Jesus is letting them in to the most intimate parts of who he is. Mm -hmm. He's letting them see the whole picture. This is total transparency here. Yeah. I, I, I made it known to you. Um, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than one lays down his life for his friends. Friends. So what is Jesus? Jesus is saying, you know, um, and I can't remember, who, uh, uh, it might have been Tim Keller or someone like that. Uh, but I, I love, and I'll probably get it wrong, but I, I've never forgot this. A pithy phrase is, a friend always lets you in and never lets you down. Mm. So a friend opens up their hearts to us. That's, there's a sense of intimacy, and, but they never let us down. Jesus is saying, look, you're going to be in the worst spot and I'm going to die for your sins. The other people, other places, you're going to get let down. Mm -hmm. But I want you to learn, because this whole chapter in John 21 is really the, the, what does it mean to be a true friend? How am I going to let you in? And how am I not going to let you down? So think about that. If, if in the church, what if we were true friends and we let people in and we, we actually were fully open and honest with one another. We shared our hearts with one another. That's really what it means to have um, intimacy. Right. But we, we weren't letting each other down. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so many, half the church has gone AWOL. Right. I mean, a lot of people feel let down by the church because everybody, I'm not going to let you in and I am going to let you down. <laughs> I, right. I, 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 it's just about me. It's all right. about me. And um, I know it's hard, so I don't want to be, uh, but if we learned what it meant to be the friends that, of Jesus that he yeah. says, right. um, this is the kind of, this, these are the kind of people who change the world, who the world says, oh my gosh, this person. Right. So, so friend, this, is all the, this is all that imagery behind that word. Of and that's the point. See, this is, we, we're coming back to this, I believe, because again, we have a highly materialistic, modernistic culture, but we're now starting to see the meta narratives and symbolism. Mm. In the ancient Near East at this time, symbolism and, and, and was so heavy and big. We don't, we discount things that would have meant a lot to the mm. original readers. Okay. So this is the culmination. Friends. So he's like, oh yeah, I forgot. We're your friends. Oh, what does it mean to be a friend? I'm going to always let you in. I'm never going to let you down. Well, he's coming to them as they've all let him down. Yeah. He's being the friend again. Right. He's modeling what the friend looks like. So he says, throw your nets on the right side, uh, 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 right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, remember, this is imagery from Luke 5. So when Jesus meets Peter, he's in Luke 5. Right. There's only one key distinction. <clears throat> There's probably two, but Jesus... That, that's the miraculous catch of fish where Peter just goes, oh my gosh, you're the Lord. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Oh yeah, you're not doing that. <laughs> right. You went back to the fishing business. But what's the difference here? Jesus isn't in the boat with them this time. Ooh. This is the new church. Ooh. So I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you but you're not going to have me in person now. You're going to have my spirit and right. you can do my work as I give you my authority right. and my presence, but I'm not going to be physically present with you in the same way, but you can still catch fish and you can still, you're going to fulfill awesome. the mission of the church. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So now this is cool. The disciple whom Jesus loved, John never names himself. <laughs> he says, it's the Lord. So this is part of the beauty again. And as soon as Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken off and he jumps in the water. So we talked about Nathaniel and uh, Thomas being two polars opposites. Right. John and Peter are the other two polar opposites. So John is the thinker. John sees things nobody else sees, mm. right? He's the first one to recognize Jesus. But he could live in his head the whole day. Peter doesn't say a word. He jumps in. Peter's the existentialist. He's just going to, he goes, and this is part of the reason why Peter is beloved. Yeah. 
because Peter is willing to obey himself and to understand. It. Yes. And, um, and so you have the thinker who sees first, but doesn't do anything. Yeah. And then you have the, the actor who says, <laughs> who does something stuff. without thinking. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and actually he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. So this is the other piece. Just let me make, I just want well, to say this and you, and you can cut me off if you need to, but I'm not going to go long on it. So people talk about the myth, mythic nature of the gospels. These are all the things that this is a kind of writing that was not, was not present at the, in this uh, era. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all eyewitness phrases. This isn't right. about a myth where there's just these big overarching allegorical. Myth. Yes. Right. With no detail. What, what do you, wait, why would you mention that? Well, the, the only reason he mentions that because he was there and right. he saw it. There's no other reason to mention. Now you might go, well, in a Jewish culture, if you're to give someone a greeting, you should be dressed. And he was wearing his like um, loincloth, but he, but that's, you know, come on, that's come true. On. But the point is John was there. So yeah. the other disciples followed in the boat, um, towing the net uh, and how, and there, and da, 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 da. So when they landed, they saw a fire burning coal, uh, burning coals uh, with fish on it and some bread. So this is the other piece. If Jesus was this apparition, like some people say, he's like this spirit being. Right, right. Spirit beings don't ha start fires. They don't see the fish in the water. They don't cook. They don't cook fish and eat it right. with bread. So this is all about the, again, the physicality of the resurrection. Jesus mm -hmm. is present in a new risen body. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you caught. Now look at verse 11. This is not accidental. And John is, may, wants us to leave this with understanding something. So who climbed back in the boat? Simon Peter. And he dragged the net ashore. Peter is the one bringing in the fish. Mm. Peter is the one. So th now the fish, it was a, um, full of large fish, um, 153 but even with so many the net was not torn now a lot of people will argue with this the net is the church mm. so what are they supposed to do they're supposed to throw in your net we're supposed to catch people and introduce them to jesus the net's the church and the the catch is so large but the net's not torn the church holds together mm. and 153 people speculate on that jerome one of the um uh, later yeah. church fathers said there were 153 kinds of fish. Mm. Now that's probably not necessarily true. We probably could name yeah, more, yeah, yeah. but the point was it represents every nation, tribe, and tongue. It's right. the universality of the church. Mm. So this is where, Hey, uh, all the barriers are broken down. The church is strong enough to hold together mm. because what does this represent? So going back to, other another image in uh, Matthew Jesus tells the disciples you're supposed to be a city on a hill mm -hmm. and this goes back to the idea of an alternate kingdom mm -hmm. so what about the original what about the other city you're supposed to be a new city a yeah. the new family the kingdom of God and you're we're living in alternate reality a kingdom mm -hmm. reality it's different than the reality of the world around us. So in the world around us, people are mean and self-centered. But yeah, in the church, we're learning how to be kind and other-centered, loving. Uh, there's greed all around the world around us. Yeah, but in the church, we're learning how to give generously. Uh, in, in the world around us, it's like survival of the fittest. And in the church, we're looking at going and saying, how do we care for those who are hurting most among us? We present the alternate rea living reality. Mm -hmm. That's part of the imagery here. And, and you know, I, I think part hopping on that, right? They get to shore. Jesus already has fish cooked and breakfast ready for them. They don't need to take from the catch to provide for their own needs. They do the thing and Jesus is providing for their needs. Yes, true. And, but here's the other part. What does Jesus tell them though? Even though he's got fish cooked. Uh, this is nothing. Jesus took bread, gave it to them, did the same with some fish. Oh, bring some of the fish you've just caught, he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So back to Genesis 1. Mm. 
They're co-laboring with God to establish the rule, to do, fulfill the purposes of God. You're going to see this. It's woven everywhere where it's like, okay, you're, you're on my team. You're on my mission. You're on my family. You're then we're doing this together. Yeah, it's great. So, um, okay. We can keep rolling there, but so Colossians two talks about being translated. So let me just say one more thing about the net. So part of catching fish is this idea of, we think of conversion or personal people coming to faith in a personal way, but and it's always that, but it, it's never less than that, but it's a lot more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Colossians, in Colossians, which is, again, a really powerful book about powers and principalities and the spiritual aspects of the world we live in, in Colossians, if you go down to, uh, in Colossians uh, uh, 2, wait a minute, where am I? Um, And did I just uh, have a little brain moment? <laughs> what are you What are you hoping for? I'm a passage on Kingdom of Darkness. Kingdom of Darkness, okay. Kingdom of Light. It's in Ephesians also, but um, what was I? Uh... Okay. Out of uh, Darkness. Colossians one thirteen dominion he frees rescues from the kingdom of darkness transferred us in the kingdom of light. yes okay yes sorry Colossians um, so, 113. yeah 113 and um uh and, P and peter mentions it too so we always kind of glaze over when we read that kind of language but it's this whole idea of colossians 113 um <clears throat> who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son whom he loves, mm -hmm. right? So this is, again, uh, let's mention one more Im piece of imagery. I, I was trying not to cover everything here, but but the sea, and again, go back to metaphors. Yeah. Imagery. The sea represents chaos and, and right. all of the um, uh, dark forces. It's the, it's, it's the kingdom of chaos. And so part of this imagery is that we're pulling – people out of this kingdom of chaos or darkness into the kingdom of light there's there's this movement and what that means is again we're living uh verse 13 here for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son whom he loves right we're helping now walking with jesus to establish a new reality uh his reality yeah again we're uh, his love is realized. And so we look at all the problems in the world around us and, and uh, we go, yeah, but in the kingdom of the son, we, we live this way. So yeah. we talk about the new family of Jesus versus the old family of this world. Right. And um, that's part of what this imagery is. So we throw in our net and, um, and we translate people. And then once we have them, we feed them. Mm -hmm. So now it's the feed my sheep passage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we yeah, talk yeah. about that. And one of the things I'll say here is just this idea of love. We said, do you love me? Um, love, there's three kinds of love in this passage. We didn't talk about that. There's supreme love. So, uh, and then there's servant love. And then there's sacrificial love. And we didn't get to the sacrificial love, but love always involves a task and a cross. Mm. It all, real love always involves responsibility and sacrifice yeah so that's what peter's being asked to do that's good and that's one of the reasons why we don't obey our way in understanding and and if again if we would just do the thing feed the sheep um then we would uh we might experience we would experience that deeper reality that jesus has for us right. more frequently and that's part of where peter says in um we didn't read verse 18 but i'm going to read it in john 21 now uh he says, uh, verse, he ends, Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Yeah. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said, an exclamation point command, follow me, mm -hmm. which means follow my example. Do what I told you to do. 
And that last piece is, you know, you're like, oh, well, that's kind of morbid. Peter's going to die. But Peter knew he was going to die. We're all going to die. Hey, if right. you're watching right now, <laughs> you're going to die. Yep. I hope my death, though, glorifies God. Right. Right. But here's the other part. Going back to mission. What is Jesus revealing here? He has a purpose for Peter. He has a plan for Peter. Right. And it's different than the plan for John. And so that's how the book ends. Mm. Uh, so he, so Peter, he says, follow me. And this is so great. So this is where John has got a, a good sense of humor. I have, uh, and so I love this because Peter's, one of Peter's biggest problems is he falls into the comparison trap all the time. Yeah. So do you love me more than these? Remember, he said he would love the, he loved Jesus more than the others. And he's comparing himself. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then you're like, okay, he gets fixed here. <laughs> and then Jesus says, well, you're going to die. You're going to stretch out your hands and, yep. and you're going to die. And then Peter, in verse 20, it says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. <laughs> so John is walking with them as they're walking down the beach. The one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? <laughs> And Jesus said, so he's comparing himself to John now. Now, this yeah. is pretty cool. Jesus said, if I answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. You do what I've called you. I have a path for you. I have works for you. I have different works for John. Yep. You follow me. Yep. And um, Peter trips back into the comparison game again, yeah. Yeah. which I love. But the underlying subtext here is, Jesus had a mission for Peter, different than his mission for John. Yeah. Jesus ha has a mission for you and for me, and they're unique. And we only discover that mission as we obey our way into following and understanding Jesus, not trying to understand our way into our mission or obedience. That's good. That's good. Well, thanks for sharing all that with us today. That was a great recap of the sermon, a great deeper dive into it. And if you're listening to this today, God has a mission for your life. He has a purpose for you. That is about stewarding the things he has made. And in this day, in this age, in this time, that is through the church. That is through the bride. And uh, the, the mission on top of the original mission is to seek and save the lost, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can if, I give uh, one last thing, Alex? Go for it. Just let me, so if you're sitting there going, oh, wow, this was interesting. Because again, we don't want to, we want... My hope is you're getting meaning, not just information. Yeah. Because that's what we long for. And here's the meaning for you and I today. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And so if you're going, how do I even start this whole journey to just go, okay, open your hands, go, Jesus, I'm not sure. I, I, I think I believe in you. I have that faith and doubt thing going on. But you just ask this question, Lord, who do you want me to take care of today for you? Yeah. And a trust God to lay that person on your heart and then just do the one simple thing. And if you live a life where you're doing that one step at a time, you will live out your purpose. God will direct you on to, into your mission. Yep. That's great. That's great. If you need help figuring that out, that's why we're here. Please yep. reach out to us uh, via Facebook, comments on our YouTube um, You can email us via our website. And if there are things you'd like us to talk about, uh, or feedback you have on the podcast, things that you're enjoying and feel are working or things you want us to try or do differently, reach out to us for that. This is a resource for you guys uh, that we might um, obey Jesus more richly in our day and age. So thank you for joining us on this episode of Tell Me More, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>